Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello and welcome to Focus on Health. I'm your host Peggy Mello. Today's guest is Dr. Paul Mengi, Medical Director for Senior Whole Health New York. Welcome to the show, Dr. Mengi. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for, for having coming. me. Uh, why don't you tell us what you do for Senior Whole Health? Um, I'm the Medical Director for the New York Division of Senior Whole Health, which is a insurance company we call ourselves, which serves uh, seniors 65 and older who have both Medicare and Medicaid, and we okay. provide a health insurance product for them. Okay. Now, today we're talking about influenza. Can right. you please give us the definition of influenza? Influenza is a respiratory illness uh, caused by a virus, uh, usually one of the primary two groups, influenza A or influenza B. And as most of us know, respiratory illness usually includes symptoms like fever, cough, sore throat, uh, headaches, or body aches. The difference between the common cold, however, and the flu is that the severity of the symptoms with influenza are much greater than for a common cold. And particularly, usually the body aches and the fever are much higher for influenza than for the common cold. Okay, and can you explain what influenza A is and what falls under influenza A? Well, there's a, respiratory viruses have a, a huge number of types. The influenza viruses are one particular group uh, and they're subdivided into A and B based on their um, anatomic structures. And um, those structures are identifiable uh, from virus to virus, and uh, that classification is used to help us understand what particular virus might be circulating in the community at any one time. Okay. And um, the one that's common nowadays is swine flu. Is Correct. that classifiable under influenza A? Swine flu is in influenza A, that's correct. Um, saying a little bit more about influenza viruses in general, um, the influenza A is the biggest family. It's the one most responsible for all the various flu outbreaks, including this one, um, around the world in the last few years. Um, and then there are subtypes of influenza A. We use those numbers like H1N1 and H2N2. The H and the N are characteristics of proteins on the surface of the virus, which again help us identify uh, kind of what family they fit into. Those proteins are also responsible for directing some of the characteristics of the virus when it infects a host cell, meaning a human cell or an animal cell. And again, that helps us characterize uh, and put them into a category and be able to follow them along around the world by their kind of their footprint or their fingerprint. Mm -hmm. um, the A viruses that have typically caused flu, flu here in the last 10 or 15 years um, had certain characteristics which made them sort of milder. The current uh, 2009 H1N1 is still in a virus, but it has a little more horsepower, to, so to speak, than, than the typical viruses have in the past. And that's part of why the uh, outbreak this year may be more severe than, than A viruses have been in the past. Okay. And there has been swine flu in the past? Have yeah. there been outbreaks uh, over time? Maybe? Yes, there have. Uh, the interesting thing is that um, if you go back to the one of the major pandemics that we have that we know about because uh, we could not really characterize viruses into families the way I'm talking about and, and establish their fingerprint until the mid 1900s. So um, in the early 1900s, there was the famous pandemic of 1918, 19, 1919, which spread around the world. 
in retrospect, by going back and examining material from people and from um, those who passed away during that time, we've been able to establish that was an A virus. Oh. It had many of the characteristics that are shared with swine flu viruses. And in that epidemic, uh, probably about 30 to 50 million people worldwide succumbed to that infection. They and died. They died. Wow. Now, that was, of course, before the advent of, of modern health care, yeah. mm -hmm. intensive care units, uh, antiviral medicines, which we have now, antibiotics to treat the secondary consequences. But, but that certainly was a serious outbreak. And then there have been subsequent outbreaks along the way of uh, swine flu as well. Interesting. Now, one of those outbreaks was, what, 30, 40 years ago? In 1976 at uh, Fort Dix um, in an army barracks, um, there was a sudden onset of a flu-like illness amongst a small number of the recruits, and one of them died. Um, oh. And it was, uh, this was uncharacteristic in that it was young adults. These were mm -hmm. presumably healthy people. Uh, and uh, there were a small number of cases uh, that was identified also as a swine flu virus. And that caused the um, CDC at the time to institute a very aggressive campaign of developing a vaccine very quickly and advocating for nationwide immunization okay. as a result of that. However, that was the, the flu itself really never spread outside the army base. And for reasons that are unknown, that outbreak really terminated uh, itself before anything could be done. Hmm. Um, and the reason for that is, is kind of unknown. But somehow, if, if somebody was vaccinated in the 70s, um, they're vaccinated for the rest of their lives. Is that true? That's, that's an interesting question. Um, I have not read any specific data about uh, looking at antibody from uh, just vaccination alone. If you look at people who were born before 1950, um, about a third of those people have antibody to some form or characteristics of at least some of the virus that's present today in, in the 2009 H1N1. Whether they acquired that naturally through the course of natural infection or some of them might have acquired that from previous swine flu vaccination has, has not been clearly characterized. But that's the reason why in the current outbreak it's thought that older citizens may have more protection than younger citizens because about a third of people have, have some antibody which may be partially um, protective. Okay. Now, what do animals have to do with influenza. Influenza A, when you look at, the, you know, avian flu, swine flu, mm -hmm. why are they all named after animals? <laughs> well, that's a good question. The, the A virus family has been known to be in animals also for as long as it was known when we were able to characterize this. And typically uh, in the past, um, there would be outbreaks of flu amongst herds of swine or in bird colonies, and uh, those, va those viruses would um, cause various degrees of illnesses in those populations. It turns out that what happens is the virus that can inhabit the animals is so close to the virus that can inhabit humans, they can actually cross mate essentially and share genes with each other. So they can, we can acquire some of the same genes that have been in a virus that infected a pig and vice versa. What makes that somewhat troublesome is it increases the ability of the viruses to cross from one species to another and to share antigenic characteristics which might make them more difficult for another species to react to because it's different material than that species has seen before. But is it, how, is it, a farmer that catches it from his pig? Or is it somebody catches it from the pig by eating the pig? I don't understand how. Oh, OK. It's all, all viruses transfers. are spread by respiratory conditions oh. uh, and respiratory droplets. So someone who's caring for an animal may very well be touching the animal, may very well get their hands, uh, uh, or feeding an animal, may, may very well get saliva from an animal on their hands. Okay. It's that transfer of saliva that would be the issue. 
uh, and vice versa. A, a person who has a human virus and is ill and caring for an animal might sneeze in their hands, yeah. touch the animal, the animal might lick their hands and they share viruses. It is not from eating the, the meat of the animal. Uh, uh, there is no danger whatsoever okay. from eating pork or eating chickens uh, that have been cooked. But um, is it easier for animals to contaminate each other when they're in a closer setting? Absolutely. Say when they're in, inside a pen rather mm -hmm. than free absolutely. rolling outside? One of the concerns about what's happening in, in uh, kind of quarantining animal outbreaks is that in these large factory farms which now exist around the world really, um, the animal industry has, has penned animals up into barns and uh, any disease, whether it's a respiratory disease or salmonella, which is everyone talks about in chickens, you know, m much of chicken is now contaminated with salmonella. It's really because of those close quarters um, that they live in so that there's um, rapid spread from one animal to another of any disease that may occur. Hmm. Okay, so anything else about the history of influenza? You uh, I think that's, that covers some important points that I think it's important for people okay. to know. So why don't we start with seasonal flu? Okay. Right now, uh, what is the prevalence in the United States? Is it higher than actually, swine? Actually, no. There's actually almost no traditional seasonal flu right now. I actually looked at the CDC website, uh, and I've looked at the New York State website regularly, and they both pretty much agree. Um, both the CDC for the national uh, state 48 or 50 states of the United States monitors flu activity um, across the country and by state, and New York State does it by county. And on each of their websites, you can actually look for the previous week and see what they have seen in terms of sampling mm -hmm. and reporting. Essentially, uh, in both those cases, both New York State and CDC for the nation, they are reporting almost no seasonal flu, which is very unusual for this time of year. Yes. Um, one of the things that looks like it may have happened, and of course it's hard to understand how this might occur, but uh, of course the, the flu season for the Southern Hemisphere just concluded, so our summer is their winter right. and their flu season. H1N1 had already occurred in the Southern Hemisphere, and it kind of looks like H1N1 actually sort of squeezed out seasonal flu, because in the Southern Hemisphere six months ago, they didn't see seasonal flu either um, in significant quantities. So we don't know what the future holds for the rest of the year. Uh, these outbreaks certainly can change, um, and I certainly uh, would advise people to be prepared for seasonal flu to come, we just haven't seen it yet. But in the past, seasonal flu killed many people, Seasonal right? flu is a very significant illness. Um, if you look back over the previous 10 years or so in the United States, um, there were roughly 35,000 deaths a year, a year from pure seasonal influenza. There's roughly 200,000 hospitalizations every year. Uh, the lost time from work and school, of course, is, is, uh, is huge. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not an insignificant illness, especially with a number like 35 or 40,000 people dying every year just from regular seasonal flu. So in that sense, you know, we worry about things being more severe, but it's not that we've never seen flu outbreaks that, that certainly have health consequences. We see them every year. Now, seasonal flu also has outbreaks. Yes. It's contagious. Yes. Um, what are the symptoms of seasonal flu? The main symptoms of seasonal flu, pretty much what I, in general, what I already mentioned, uh, high fever, usually over 101, and that often lasts for two or three days, okay. significant sore throat, significant cough, significant headache, and especially body aches and, and muscle aches that can last more than a day or two. So again, okay. many of the same things as the common cold, but more severe. Okay, and very different from the common cold. In terms of severity and complications, absolutely. Okay. Uh, pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia is the most common complication of uh, seasonal flu. And uh, okay. roughly 5% to 20% of people who are hospitalized will, will, and sometimes higher in higher age groups and younger age groups, will uh, have complications of uh, bacterial pneumonia. And that's 
when there's death, it is yeah. often because of bacterial yeah. pneumonia that, that takes over. Okay. One thing to just quickly mention about that, uh, which uh, is, is sort of directly related to the flu, there's been a real change about uh, recommendations by the CDC for pneumonia vaccination. Um, pneumonia vaccination, we do have an immunization, which we've had for many years. Oh. It's now given to young children as part okay. of their, their childhood immunizations. And there's another shot that was specifically for those over the age of 65. Previously, we had left the age group between childhood and 65 without a recommendation for pneumococcal vaccination. Uh, the CDC just this year, as a result of looking at flu outbreaks and the consequences, has said people between the age of childhood and 65 who have medically compromising conditions should all also get pneumonia vaccine. Uh -huh. So people who are viewing the program who are in their 30s or 40s or 50s who have asthma or heart disease or diabetes or who are smokers okay. should be asking their doctors about getting a pneumonia vaccine as well as their other regular vaccinations. Hmm. Now, how does a medical practice diagnose seasonal flu? Is there a certain test that you do or is do you have to do you have to do a test to rule out seasonal flu versus H1N1? There are a number of tests that are available using either saliva or nasal secretions or throat secretions. There are different types and different ways to do it, but they're essentially a swab of either the swab. nose or the throat, okay. um, which can be treated in various ways. There is a rapid test which can be done in the office, and the result is obtained. Uh, immediately within about a five or ten minute window uh, and then there are tests that are sent off to a local laboratory or to the um, uh, New York State Health Department that take anywhere from 24 to 48 hours to get a result. Um, the difficulty with all of those is that um, the rapid test has a high false negative rate, oh. meaning that it will often say you don't have flu when you do. Um, and the other thing is that since the antiviral medications for both regular flu and H1N1 have their best opportunity for benefit in the first 48 hours, you don't want to rely on waiting for a test that takes 48 hours to turn around to decide if you're going to give an antiviral medication. Okay. So clinically, okay. what has been advised okay. across the board is uh, that physicians and healthcare providers should make a clinical judgment yeah. um, when seeing a patient or talking to a patient and make their decision to treat or not to treat based on that clinical judgment, not based on the results of tests. Okay. And does, does uh, a seasonal flu respond to antibiotics? What is the treatment for it? Uh, seasonal flu, the drugs available for influenza are basically the same for seasonal flu and H1N1. That's uh, oseltamivir or Tamiflu, which is a pill or liquid for children, okay. and relenza or uh, renimavir, which is an inhaled uh, powdery medication, which is inhaled and is, uh, it can be used for children and adults as well. Okay, so that's the same treatment for H1N1? For both. Yes, yes. Oh. Yes. Now, is seasonal flu influenza B? No, seasonal, f oh. seasonal flu for the most part is influenza A. It's, uh, oh. it's a different variant from the, from the 2009 swine flu H1N1. You know, we've had trouble really with naming these things because the name was changed several times of the swine flu. The right. people thought it was bad to call it swine flu, so they sort of gave it different names. It was called novel H1N1, and okay. now it's really be call, being called 2009 H1N1 to differentiate it from seasonal influenza, which also can be caused by a different H1N1 uh, oh. vaccine, uh, different virus. Interesting. Yeah. So what's the story with vaccines? Um, if somebody has already been diagnosed with influenza A this mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. um, should they try to get a vaccine? It makes sense for people to be vaccinated if they can, regardless of the previous history. Uh, the reason is that um, the vaccine actually, can, the seasonal vaccine contains three different viruses. Um, it contains and those viruses were selected based on last year's experience of what viruses circulated in the community, both here and elsewhere around the world. Oh. And so we never know what really what is 
going to happen three months from now, we could have an outbreak of, of an influenza which is different from anything that is currently being seen because of travel and the rapidity of spread of infection around the world. Mm -hmm. Things appear very quickly, as we saw with, with uh, H1N1 swine flu. Look at how quickly that came along and what how rapidly that spread around the world. Mm -hmm. it, it was just amazing. And um, that could happen with another virus and influenza vaccine might pr provide some protection about that. Okay, and who should actually, is it everyone should get it or who shouldn't get it or who should get? Traditional the influenza vaccine initially was recommended primarily for um, those 65 and older, okay. for children, and for uh, young adults with medically compromising conditions and pregnant women. Those same recommendations still apply. Um, and uh, basically anyone else who wants to get regular influenza vaccine, if the supply is sufficient, is, is a candidate. There's really no one who shouldn't except for that small group of contraindications, which is allergies to eggs, previous severe reaction to flu, um, okay. association of Guillain-Barre with uh, a previous vaccination under six months or if you're ill at the time. Those are the only contraindications to either flu vaccine. Okay, and what is thimerosal and why should pregnant women or other patients pursue a thimerosal-free vaccine? Thimerosal is a uh, preservative which is used to extend the shelf life of the vaccine once it's packaged. Oh. We have to remember that this is made in a highly sterile environment, um, but in, in long distances and travel times away from where, where it's going to be administered. Um, it's often in multi-use vials, uh, which may, once they're opened, may not be used immediately. They may be used in an office over the course of a week. So for all those reasons, the solution needs to be maintain its sterility once it's left the manufacturing plant. So thimerosal is a mercury-based okay. um, preservative, which is used to do that. In the case of pregnant women and children under three, it has felt that balancing benefit versus risk, that some vaccine should be made without that preservative because of the concern of mercury levels in small children and pregnant women. Okay. Um, those vaccines are produced differently in uh, individual syringes uh, so that, and they have a shorter turnaround time. So for example, okay. if I get some of that in my office, I have to use it within a much shorter time window than a multi-use vial that has preservative in it. And so that's why it's generally okay. limited to a smaller population. And the multi-use vial, is that what is put into the nose? No, the, the nasal vaccine is also pre-filled in syringes. Oh. The multi-use vial would be what we would use for most of our injections um, in most of the population except for the, the pregnant women and uh, the children under three. So most adults would get, in most cases, a uh, injection that uh, the nurse draws up out of a multi-use vial and fills a syringe with the one dose that that patient needs. Okay. Well, as long as the pregnant woman can tell which one they're getting. <laughs> There's a requirement that they sign um, that pregnant women have to be given a sheet and children under three, their parents have to be given a sheet uh, that tells them about the thimerosal-free vaccine. Um, the CDC has made uh, an exception to allow providers to offer um, the non-thimerosal-free vaccine to women and children um, if they choose to use it, if they can't get the thimerosal free. Okay. So there is an exception, but there's a specific uh, release that requires that to be done. And so whenever you get a flu vaccine in any office of any type, you have to sign a, a sheet that basically tells you what you're getting. Okay. Now, what's been happening with the production levels of se seasonal flu vaccine this year? And what's the difference between this year and last year? Uh, last year, the manufacturers around the world, there, there are five companies that make vaccine, only five in the entire world uh, for all the vaccine in the world. There is only one of those companies in the United States. Um, and so all this work to create vaccine of any type, whether it's seasonal flu vaccine or H1N1, mm -hmm. is all done by five companies. 
So last year in 2008 and 9, uh, in the United States, we gave about 110 million or 120 million doses of vaccine, and that was almost all that was manufactured for the orders last year. So not much went to waste, but it was felt that it was about the right number. This year, when they planned for the seasonal uh, flu vaccine, that planning was done before H1N1 came to be, and we even knew about it. So that plan was to produce about 10% more, and those orders were placed by offices and health departments a, a long time months ago, ago, months ago. Um, so that production was started, uh, and it was on schedule, and they had were just about at the completion point of producing that 110 or 120 million doses, and H1N1 came along. Mm. And then the whole thing changed because the, the CDC very quickly and the World Health Organization very quickly went to the companies and said, you, you know, you have to convert to making H1N1 vaccine now. Some of them were not done with their seasonal flu runs. And um, so that resulted in kind of less additional vaccine than had been planned for in the seasonal flu vaccine and caused a rapid shift to H1N1 production, which then had its own set of problems. There were a number of things that occurred there that made the production of H1N1 um, less in quantity than had been hoped for. They had really hoped for 200 million doses of H1N1 for just the United States, and that has not happened. Okay, so there's definitely a shortage. Yes. Uh, did you find that more people are requesting seasonal flu vaccines? Absolutely. And, and across the country, uh, what has been found is that suppliers uh, sent the shipments that had been requested by providers. In my office, for example, uh, we, we gave out our seasonal allotment, the first shipment, much faster than we normally did. Many people who had previously said, I don't need a flu vaccine, I don't want one, I don't want to get it, came in and said, oh, yes, I'll take it. So we really created additional demand for seasonal flu vaccine, which we then can't fill because there's not any extra. Hmm. So where do we find out where we can get a flu shot? Do we call our local providers or the health department? I think all of those are possibilities. Um, uh, the most physicians uh, have a pretty good handle on what they expect for flu vaccines, so people can call their personal physician. Every county health department has a plan in place for uh, the delivery of vaccine and can tell people what the plan is. The um, CDC website and the New York State website also have uh, information on clinics that are occurring and providers who have vaccine. Okay. And you also have the New York State hotline. 1-800-808-1987. Uh, right. That's a hotline you can call for information. Okay. It took us a long time to finish seasonal flu. <laughs> uh, let's start with H1N1. Um, you have talked about previous, uh, we have had previous epidemics right. of H1N1. Right. Um, the prevalence in the United States, what is that? So far, um, again, looking at the CDC website and the New York, New York State website just last week, it looked like there had been about, across the country, they're estimating somewhere around 22 million cases of H1N1 wow. across the United States. There have been about 100,000 hospitalizations and about 4,000 deaths in the United States. We've had States. local deaths, right? We have had local deaths. New York State, outside of New York City, has had about 44 deaths so far in the upstate counties between the April start and roughly October when the numbers, or November when the numbers were, were kind of up to date. Um, so it's certainly not insignificant, um, but again, remembering that 35,000 deaths a year across the United States from seasonal influenza, mm -hmm. um, it, it certainly isn't unexpected that right. this would occur. Okay, so s symptoms of, of H1N1, right. how are they different from seasonal flu? The main difference is, uh, I, I think I'm seeing in my own experience and my own patients that um, we're seeing fevers last a little longer, we're seeing muscle aches last a little longer, we're also seeing something we don't usually see with the regular flu, which is nausea and vomiting. Um, oh. Usually we think of a respiratory illness as being respiratory, you know, our breathing passage is not our intestinal tract, so most people with regular flu, seasonal flu, don't have 
much GI tract, nausea, vomiting kind of things. We are seeing a fair amount of that with H1N1. I don't quite know why. So if somebody has a fever, body aches and chills, mm -hmm. and they're home, what should they do? Main thing is um, they're using the term shelter in place, which is stay home, take care of yourself, um, plenty of fluids, uh, you know, eat, eat to the degree people feel they can, get lots of rest. Um, uh, most people with flu, despite all the discussion of complications, the majority of people with flu will ride it out and um, they'll be fine. Uh, they certainly should be in contact with their provider if they feel like their symptoms are progressing and getting worse. They're having trouble okay. breathing, they're having chest discomfort, they're feeling sick or, or nausea and vomiting so they can't eat. One of the things I encourage people to not do is take themselves with their early case of flu to the emergency room. Mm. Um, emergency rooms are really not the place to treat the flu, um, and uh, people should really be encouraged to uh, stay home, and if they have a concern, call their provider and discuss what's going on and what their concern is, because that's the best way to, to direct things for the best outcome for them. Are they going to be able to call their provider and get... Tamiflu or whatever treatment they would need um, done over the telephone? Most providers now are pretty well geared up to be able to do what needs to be done about that. The CDC has actually recommended that for most people who um, have symptoms that a telephone triage is uh, okay. sufficient. If that person has symptoms of the flu that uh, are very consistent and has some risk factors for complications, such as uh, being a pregnant woman or having a respiratory condition in addition to the flu symptoms, mm -hmm. they can be given Tamiflu over the phone and, uh, number one, avoid a visit that might contaminate the office um, and also provide the early, early treatment to them that is appropriate to keep them from getting more ill. Uh, certainly, if they're getting sicker, uh, then generally we're going to want to see them or we're going to want to do something. We're not going to do things over the phone if they call and say, I've been sick for two or three days and now today my fever went up and I'm, you know, I'm coughing and having trouble breathing. Those we will absolutely would not treat over the phone. That person needs to be seen. Okay. And how long should they stay away out of the public? That's a really tough question. Um, initial advice pretty much from the CDC and most experts was that for 24 hours after your fever was gone, at most 48, you were pretty okay to mix about, uh, again, go back to work, go back to school, okay. that you probably weren't infective. There was a recent study done which looked at some young, healthy adults who found virus lasting longer in their secretions than that. I think in general, if people feel reasonably well, their fever is gone, they're not having a terrible cough, and it's 48 hours, I think that's reasonable to go back to work or school. They should still take extra precautions to protect others, such as making sure they're, uh, they're not coughing openly, they're using tissue that they dispose of, they're washing their hands frequently to protect others. Okay. Um, I've heard an astounding statistic that swine flu or H1N1 can kill one out of 25 infected pregnant women. Mm -hmm. um, why is it that somebody who's pregnant is so much at risk? There's multiple issues. Um, pregnancy is a stress, uh, uh, although a wonderful good stress. It is still a physiologic stress on a woman's body, so her ability to mount an immune response to handle multiple stresses is reduced somewhat because she's already dealing with one stress of supporting another organism, another baby. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, uh, since flu carries with it high fevers often, high fevers in and of themselves are, are uh, a danger to women, especially in their third trimester, because a high okay. fever can initiate labor prematurely before mom is ready and baby is ready, and both of those things are, are significant stressors. Okay, so who else um, is going to be at risk? It's basically the same as seasonal flu, right? It's Young majority family. of it is the same. The one difference is that we, we think the folks above 65 are not as susceptible to coming down with flu because of that immune memory I talked about before, oh, okay. that some of them have immune antibody um, from before. 
Having said that, though, it is also true that we are seeing deaths in all age groups um, across the United States and in okay. New York State. Particularly emphasize, though, that the high-risk people are, are children and pregnant women and young adults with other medical conditions. Um, the swine flu definitely does hit younger people harder than traditional influenza for reasons that we don't know. Okay. Um, now, what about in the interest of public health? What, um, what can schools do to keep a virus from spreading, or what, what can... What can a job place or workplace yeah. do? It's, it's very difficult because um, everybody, of course, is talking about screening and staying home if you're sick and, and those kind of things, hand washing. It, it's important to remember that one is actually infective before you are sick. So that for in the day before you develop symptoms of the flu, you are actually contagious to others. Okay. So unfortunately, in schools and workplaces, People who have all the best intentions and will stay home when they get sick are very often at work or school in that day before and spreading the virus before they know enough to stay home. And there's really not much you can do about that. So in the absence of that, it goes back to basic strong hygiene. You know, everybody taking precautions with their secretions, everyone washing their hands, everyone coughing and sneezing into tissues or their arm and not using their hands. Um, and um, uh, making sure that uh, people who have sick children at home uh, so that they might be at risk, be especially cautious about uh, coming into work or school, um, those kind of things. It's very difficult in the school environment. My wife is a uh, school nurse. And, uh, oh, boy. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> they've, they've had their hands full. Um, and uh, it's been difficult. Wow. Now, are there different... Um, reports on how long a virus lives, <laughs> whether it's seasonal flu or um, H1N1. You mean lives in the human body? Lives on a surface. Oh, on a surface. Um, I honestly don't know to what degree they've actually studied that. I, I know it has been studied, you know, if you put a virus on a surface and go back every 15 minutes and swab it, you know, how, how long can you still, is it still viable? But I actually don't know what the data is about that. I mean, I heard a story about how universities, the English teachers, were storing papers that kids submitted in a box yeah. for 24 to 48 hours until yeah. whatever viruses were on them. I don't know were if that dead. would work or not. I honestly don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the other thing is, you know, if if you're diagnosed with something, how long you stay out of work before your right. coworkers actually feel that they're safe around you. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> Okay, um, so we should definitely Purell our hands. Is there one product that's better than another? Or are they all the same? Uh, the thing to do is look at the alcohol content. Um, the hand sanitizers are primarily alcohol, and they should okay. be at least 60% alcohol. Okay. Somewhere on the little bottle will be a tiny little label okay. that says how much alcohol. If it's less than 60, don't get it. It should be greater than 60, and uh, the type of alcohol is not as important as the concentration. Um, and in terms of using that product, it's important to make sure that enough is used. Some, oftentimes you'll see people put a tiny little dab on their hand and kind of rub their palms together and they're done. No. You really have to use it like a hand wash and it should keep your hands wet for 20 seconds. Okay. And you should do your, all surfaces of your hands completely before it dries. Okay. Try not to shake hands. A lot of people <laughs> are advocating that. That's right. Uh, it, it is a difficult issue. It's such a strong social custom. Perhaps those, those cultures who bow at each other are much better off in I the know. current environment. But uh, it'll be a bit of a transition here, I think, to do that. I think I, I, I just I can't help but feel that every surface I touch is putting me at risk. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's a cart at a supermarket, I mean, it's, it's all it's scary. You, all the things you think of that we all do every day, uh, almost every one of them has a potential for passing secretions from one person to another. Okay. And I think all we can do is, is be cautious and uh, you know, use our hand hygiene, having that little Purell or one of those products in your pocket or, or purse uh, and using it much more often than you would ever thought to do it is, is probably your best protection when all is said and done. Okay. 
So there are further resources. Let's mention some websites. Uh, the big one is the flu.gov. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, national, it's the federal site, right? Right. Okay. right. That's a great site. It has all kinds of um, links to advice, uh, recommendations, discussions about vaccine, information about the Tamiflu and other medications which are used, and it particularly has links you can put in your location and it will try to help you find a, a local provider for a vaccine. Good. Okay. There's also SeniorWholeHealth.com. That's our <laughs> website. Uh, we have information on there. We don't, we don't provide links to flu vaccine at this point. Uh, okay. our, our website doesn't really do that. It's really more, more specific information about our insurance program. Okay, and then the New York State Department of Health, health.state.ny.us. Yes. That will also link to vaccine. It does. Patients. That also has a number of great resources, including, again, uh, handouts you can send for uh, that are free okay. uh, about the flu. And Good. you can also put in your county, um, and it will tell you about your access to your local uh, county health department and to vaccine clinics in your area. Okay, and then lastly, uh, the New York State hotline phone number. Uh, 1 800 808 1987. Um, and they can find out just basically the only thing that does is tells them where to go for a vaccine? Correct. That's my understanding. I did not do my research completely and call that before I came just to see <laughs> what it did. So I, I, okay. I have that by report. <laughs> all right. All right. So I guess we're all set. Thank you, Dr. Mengi. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for watching. We hope to see you next time on Focus on Health.